So uh, as I said, um, good evening. My name is Anton Konyuk. Um, if you uh, have seen previously, I'm blogging a lot on konyuk.com. I'm working generally in the industry of network, network automation for a um, couple of, I mean, in networking about 10 years, in network automation about five years with various, various things. And um, had an opportunity over my career to work uh, quite a while with Nokia uh, devices. Um, interestingly, there are not that many information in the internet which you could find about the Nokia automation or Nokia in general. So it's very different to what you could find for Cisco and uh, Aristo or Junipers. And uh, that's why we decided, okay, let's create something interesting because uh, Nokia is quite popular, especially in service providers field. And um, I think you might have seen uh, or heard recently the announcement that uh, for the first time ever, Nokia were able to reach uh, um, number one market share in IPH, uh, which is a significant milestone for a long, long time. Cisco was a clear leader, and now we see that market is changing a bit. Um, all these things actually made us think, okay, given that we have some expertise in the Nokia, we have uh, expertise with Ansible and all the start, um, and all other sort of automation, uh, and also given that a lot of people are, have to be self-isolated this day and sitting at home, we decided to create such a webinar. Um, the format, how uh, we uh, foresee, it, so it's a conversation, so we, there are a topic that we'd like to share, we'll be showing some slides, we will show you some demo with uh, uh, Nokia devices, so not just speaking how these things are working, but also showing you in reality how does it work. If you have any questions, feel free to post them in chat. Uh, we'll be picking up them at the end of each blog or something we'll perhaps put to the end of our conversation today. Um, but generally, feel free to ask any question, anything that you see uh, not clear, or if you have some ideas or from your experience, we really appreciate all your sharing and that would uh, make uh, this conversation more uh, valuable for you, first of all. From what we have prepared for you, the uh, agenda looks like um, in the next slide. We'll start a generic discussion about the network automation. I'm pretty sure as you are in this webinar, you understand what it is and why uh, do you need it. We will explain it from our side, where we see their first and uh, very important uh, point where you could start working with the automation. However, obviously there are many, many cases. We'll talk a look onto the Ansible, why it is so popular and why generally people are speaking about Ansible these days. Uh, we'll take a look how Ansible could help particularly for us with Nokia. So what are the modules exist, what are the options for the Ansible to interact with um, Nokia devices. And uh, we will do a two demos, uh, showing some ideas, some details and um, showing in the CLI level uh, how you could uh, interact with the uh, Ansible to get some information from Nokia devices to analyze this information and how to configure um, Nokia devices. At the end, we'll uh, give you some more uh, insights on what is changing in the Nokia and uh, how these changes should be anticipated into your automation that you are doing with the Ansible. Um, yeah, we plan roughly that it, our journey today should take about one and a half up to two hours. If we are quicker, we are quicker. If we are longer, we are longer. I said uh, the webinar is recorded and will be uh, posted later on on our YouTube channel. The first question that we would like to cover today is why do we need automation? I think everyone who has ever worked is uh, in the network industry, uh, especially in the operational field, um, has its own view on that. But generically, one of the most important things where network automation could help, I mean, uh, th there might be multiple layers and we speak about this today, but uh, the, the simplest way in, in particular for network automation, because uh, like Samsung, it requires investment in the company, uh, where is our quick wins? So what are our quick wins? What we, why automation makes our, our life easier or better? And the immediate answer where network automation could help is implementing of standard changes. So if you take a look at the standard service provider, 
or not only service provider, let's say the environment that is very um, IT oriented and uh, requires the stability of the network. Service provider is one example. Another example, all sort of financial trading company where really no outage is possible here in the working days. Uh, or a big data centers where, again, a lot of uh, application is running on which um, the dependency of um, uh, a lot of customers, I mean, internal or externals, is built. So this requires, I mean, this such an environment requires a stability. Stability means that the process, how the change is implemented in the network need to be very tightly controlled. The reason obviously is stability, but on the other hand of this control is that at the current stage there are a lot of manual uh, steps within the uh, process uh, of the ticketing processing. Um, let's take a look on this uh, standard uh, change flow. There is a common requirement that we need to do some network change. Network change uh, in its most simplest way is a some change of configuration of network device. So for service provider, it might be connection of new customer, like for mobile operators, uh, connectivity of 3G, 4G, 5G base stations or whatever. For the data centers, it might be just building a new pod or connection of new routers, um, connecting with new firewalls and something that require the network, the changing of live network, what potentially might affect the customers. Um, the change request, depending on the company, so the environments where I have worked, I've worked in very like, controlled environment, uh, worked in uh, some uh, like um, less controlled environment, doesn't matter how. It starts with a change request. So change request typically can uh, contain the information. What should be done? Like we would like to configure in the, uh, we would like in region ABC to connect base station uh, with the name uh, DEF, then the operation guy starts looking, okay, so uh, we would like to integrate the base station. What do we need to do for that? And we start looking in some databases, um, what is the router or switch or microwave unit or whatever or optical link where we would like to connect this base station. So from network equipment to which port this will be ultimately connected. Start looking if there is enough uh, ports if the ports are free, if we have SFP models, if um, the physics are okay, starts looking faster. So what are their IP addresses? What are the VLANs? What are their type of VPN that interconnects this base station from the router somewhere uh, to another side, to backend where you have your controller? So um, if it is uh, layer two, so it's VPLS, so it's eVPN, so what are the associated parameters like uh, LDP tunnels or bindings of the session or uh, if it is layer three or, or EVP and also route distinguish. I mean, all these sort of parameters, they need to be taken somewhere. Um, in many cases, uh, again, depending on the company, some companies has already NMSs that's doing things automatically. But uh, from at least my experience and my experience of my colleagues, what I have seen a lot of companies in service provider world has grown over the years. And with this growth, they were growing with the ecosystem of all their uh, systems around. And uh, it means that uh, some of the data, like IP addresses, might be in, in one database. Um, ports and modeling of device could be in another database. Um, some information about what devices are really live and what are on the plan to be built there in the short database. And all this variety of various um, information source taking typically some time uh, for the operation uh, team in order to prepare the, the necessary configuration. Even assuming that they have sort of template that they could implement, still need to collect this information. Um, once this information is collected, there is a something in the service providers and in, I mean, in control environment, data centers world as well, uh, something called the change board. So change board meaning that someone needs to approve this change. So this is correct. Um, how does it typically look like that some other piece engineer is reviewing this? I mean, in ideal world, it should be like this. Um, and then the manager say, okay, fine. I'm, I'm fine to take uh, this uh, uh, change into a pipeline of production. They are, Maintenance is scheduled, 
at some point in time and then the change is implemented at some uh, day and afterwards the change implemented so uh, the job is done and the customer is notified that something has happened um, in reality it could take in a lot of time so generally it it may take starting from a couple of days up to a couple of weeks. It depends how they are, um, how much is the load for a certain team. So um, again, providing some highlights in, in a lot of companies there are a lot of, um, uh, let's say a uh, season job. So uh, in source provider world, very popular stuff like preparation for sort of benchmarking and measurement where uh, their network are uh, getting prepared for a certain benchmark which are um, somehow normalizing various operators to each other and this is typically very hot um, period of time which uh, mean that if the change is not somehow related to the process of the network preparation um, it will be postponed because it's just not prioritized um, and uh, this typically leads to the point where sort of uh, power game starting which change is more important which change is less important uh, just because the capacity of their uh, team who is doing the changes in the live network are limited and uh, they need to cope with also some ongoing maintenance ongoing outages and uh, the the time needed to implement the change administration another point is also um, the example I have provided is from the company itself. The company owns a mobile network, company owns a backhaul, backbone network, and they extend the network. Another example, when the company uh, is leasing, let's say, PMPLS service from a certain service provider, and uh, the process to change some parameters, like um, I had once in my life very, um, let's say, interesting example where I was working for one of the big IT company and there was leasing MPMPLS source from another big company from source providers and just to modify some curious parameters so they don't touch even uh, their backbone or capacity or their uh, interconnection was taking really weeks and obviously from the customer perspective from the company was very unhappy that taking so long just to tweak some basic parameter. Um, what it does mean for the company? It means for the company, uh, for the source provider that, uh, or for the company that are not automating many processes that they are getting like it. On the other hand of this, uh, or on the other, uh, let's say, uh, spectrum, there is sort of hyperscalers like clouds where everything is um, created in a way self-service that the customer could take their unnecessary um, compute power or memory or whatsoever and uh, based on this approach the customer is getting the resources almost instantly and the customer typically wants the same from all type of IP services what they want and their network is just another like commodity or another part of such a service that should be provided in this way so uh, all in all this creates a paradigm that there are companies need doing things quicker. It doesn't mean that it's possible all the time to make the changes quicker. However, it's definitely the goal and uh, from all the researchers that are conducting these days, or even recent year, from big companies such as Gartner or whatever, the major trend in the networking right now is automation or if it is not, it should be because it's not like getting a luxury to have it. The amount of the changes that needs to be done in the network is increasing and increasing daily because service is getting more flexible the pace of network routing getting quicker just to cope with the data that necessary to be transferred from the network and so on and so forth. So that is why the automation of routine changes, I mean something simple, is one of the biggest and I think uh, um, from what I was doing, from what I see, um, time sales for the companies it could just try any sort of investment in the automation just because their uh, outcome of this is visible immediately and such sort of quick wins is very important for implementing the automation where automation could help with this and approach right uh, we don't speak right now about any particular uh, product we just speak about the generic logic so what the customer expect 
despite regardless whether it is internal or external customer, that there must be some sort of change request which is coming somewhere from customer, uh, internal, external, from another subsystem that requires some part of the network automate, that requires some network service. And the expectation is that the service at certain extent, if it is like fitting some predefined variables, could be created almost instantly. So the automation logic is getting requests. The request is supposed to be get in the uh, sort of API call, which removes the necessity of sending mail or whatsoever to do a change. The change is, the change request is coming sort of API call that could be processed by the logic to understand the parameters what are coming as an input and um, it starts working further. So it understands to perform such an operation, let's say provision of the new um, base station in the region ABC. He needs to find, I mean, he, it, um, the uh, network controller, I mean, the automated logic needs to understand uh, based on some data, which router should it take? So perhaps doing some geographical analysis or whatever, how does it look like? So it needs to grab some data about the position of the router, if there is some geolocation or whatever. Understand that uh, this router based on like amount of the ports, uh, based on the location, geographical based on the amount of free ports, it's the best one. Allocate some port, uh, provide the necessary IP addresses, provide necessary VLANs provide necessary other information like various uh, VPN parameters. Uh, created template, uh, well, take the created template which exists for such a service, put the data there, verify that create configuration is accurate before it is applied to the network, and then automatically push uh, change to the network. So if the change is disruptive and it is known that it is disruptive, like what the disruptive change might be update of uh, the GP policy on the pure router. So um, it might be dis uh, disruptive because it takes, uh, I mean, depending on the uh, software version domain, depending on the bugs that exist in the software, um, that there might be some issues. However, the adding of the base station, or adding on the customer on the network typically is very uh, easy task that is done in the company thousands of times. And, um, in like 99,99 uh, cases, it's not disruptive. So before it could be almost instantly um, implemented, which would allow the necessity on the one hand to have a long scheduled maintenance uh, and all associated courses. On the other hand, it would uh, make possibility to deliver service quicker, especially, uh, I mean, we could argue that for base station, in any case, takes some time to build the base station. It could be true. However, if you think a bit further about the uh, providing customer, at some extent, possibility to manage uh, uh, his or her own services, that is definitely a lot of customer would wish to do. It doesn't mean that, that when we implement the automated logic, we remove this change control and we don't track changes. No. And uh, perhaps in the case where we automate the implementation of changes, the uh, tracking on what is done must be even tighter. But it means that if we have a predefined test that, that we are checking our um, created configuration against and uh, tracking somewhere in the configuration management database, the change is done, what the configuration was sent, and perhaps doing some diff analysis that, um, makes the process, uh, first of all, very good documented. Second, uh, taking these tests, it, it makes it safe for the network. So, because one of the biggest worry, what I have heard over my career speaking about the network automation, so what if network automation would break something? For sure it might break if not properly tested in the lab environment, if not properly tested in some sort of pilot environment. But the same uh, possibility exists that the people could break something, especially if there is a new grad or, I mean, graduate engineer or a junior engineer or even senior sometimes doing some weird stuff. So uh, that's why there is no protection that if even experienced uh, engineer is doing the job, it will be done accurately. Yes, the probability is quite high, but still. Same with automation, so where once it is trained and tested properly, it would work nice. If you think from the bigger perspective about the network automation, so it ties just uh, the configuration management. However, 
the configuration management is just one uh, uh, part of this puzzle. Their whole network operation domain uh, job is fitting to their uh, so-called FCAPS uh, management system. So FCAPS uh, is a um, uh, part of uh, ISO tele telecommunication network management domain which covering all parts of the network operation. So it contains fault management, configuration management, accounting, performance, and security. So each of these domain um, has come from its name, is focused on a specific task. So fault management is a restoration of the networking of the network once something has happened. Uh, when we think about the automation uh, in this area, what does typically the engineer do when uh, he or she sees that some, let's say, link goes down or device goes down? Starts analyzing the log. So let's say if the link went down, starts analyzing what were the associated information beforehand. What were the, if we speak about the optical network, what was the optical level on the SFPs, uh, if it was possible to collect information, were there any alarms? Um, if the physical media is stable, if we see just routing protocol went down again, so what has happened there? Uh, what are the other associated log? So typically each and every engineer has uh, in its mind the process, uh, the, the certain sequence of steps that he or she takes in order to solve the problem. And in this case, a network automation could be handy in terms of creating such sort of, uh, let's say, uh, information collection and some basic analysis steps that will help engineer um, in the way that if there is a problem, engineer is running the script um, at the first step. He or she runs the script manually and um, the scripts collect the necessary information, analyze it, and um, uh, put uh, this analysis up to engineer to decide what to do further. Um, the second step, once at least there is a working um, mechanism how in a programma, programmable way to collect the information, analyze it and uh, provide the result, how this could be triggered automatically. So something that is called the closed loop automation where not the engineer triggering the step, now uh, triggering the script, but something behind it. And this second step, so for first we need to have at least the first step uh, which allows us to collect the necessary information and analyze it. So same with configuration management. The idea with configuration management that the, uh, the tool, the network controller, is able to configure any sort of network device which is connected to the network, whether it is Nokia, Cisco, Arista, Juniper, does it matter? I mean, um, from the operator perspective, it doesn't um, matter what the device is. From the network operator perspective, it is important that device that is um, connected operates properly. So again, here a sort of idea that you need to have a sort of um, toolkit that allows you once the device connected to the network, run a bunch of script or a bunch of uh, programs which uh, populates the device with the configuration, IP addresses, routing, MPLS, BGP, BRFs, big stand, whatever is running on the device. And again, like with default management, the first step, the second step could be that the configuration management is also running automatically based on some logs or whatever is coming in from the network. From the accounting maintaining perspective, uh, from the accounting management perspective, the idea is that the uh, network has a lot of information. So, uh, and uh, in traditional understanding the accounting management is something that allows uh, us to build their uh, customers so based on the radius information or just to track what are the users doing in the network. Here uh, when we speak about the network automation the idea that we could extend this um, logic uh, not just by having a simple radius responses that uh, the customer should be dropped or put in the unroutable VLAN but rather having the certain inputs from another subsystem be able to change the network configuration on demand. Like um, if the customer is uh, um, like using um, some sort of, um, the customer wants to change the, the, their uh, plan, like um, temporary for a couple of hours, just changing the bandwidth, it's like able to, to them or prioritizing some sort of traffic, but he or she should be able uh, to do it on demand 
or we rather on the network behavior could understand what's going on the network and uh, run again a change of configuration of QoS policies or change the reroute of their um, you know, traffic engineering tunnels that don't matter if it's running standard or speed here, so means reading something that changes the network based on the customer uh, requirement. Performance management, again, we're speaking about possibility that uh, in the current networks using a capability of telemetry, it's possible to collect really a lot of information. And perhaps you might have heard a very nice uh, proverb, the data is in your oil. And it is in reality. So the more information you have and you know how to process it, well, there are several steps. First of all, you could extract information. Second, you uh, have this information, could deploy logic, so how to process it to create some valuable product, say to analyze the trades in the network and automatically generate uh, their request for uh, a break or for purchasing something just because the amount of the traffic in the network is growing and uh, based on the trends that you are building soon you might um, uh, face the problem that there is not enough capacity. From security management um, perspective, uh, that's again about collecting all what is happening in the, net, in the network, uh, understanding there whether there was an attempt, um, attacks, understanding if there is some um, um, unexpected behavior that's deviating from the bait lines, or if there is some uh, configuration changes not authorized, no uh, to put into the configuration management database, so they need to be removed from the network, and so on and so forth. So the generic idea that Within their each domain, there are typically some sort of routine tasks which are waiting to be automated. And if they are automated, you could uh, start getting a lot of uh, free time, hopefully a lot of free time, or at least some um, portion of uh, free time that you could start uh, uh, using for really network development rather than network operation or on further development of the automation. So, um, I think it was, perhaps you might have heard is anything uh, from the standard from we have on the network. Uh, the core idea that automation is really uh, getting to be handy, just providing from my own experience as an engineer. So, um, a, a lot of uh, things that we are doing in the network right now, just impossible to do without the automation, just because the amount how we're building the networks where um, uh, I'm helping companies with are uh, so quick that doing manage more configuration, manual provision, uh, even manual validation of the information device, just no way you could uh, you could survive. So that's why in other in one or another shape or form, automation is either already in the networks or if it is not yet there, it definitely uh, should be coming there soon. And that is where the Ansible uh, comes into the place uh, onto the stage and I think one of the uh, best tools especially if you're not very familiar with automation yet and would like to off, uh, kick off the either something in your network I mean uh, project oriented or at least your career in the world where I think one of the most quickly developing these days around the network automation so the Ansible is um, so the phrase that you see I just uh, copy paste from the Ansible uh, web page. So the Ansible is a tool which um, makes the network automation, general automation from the network, very very simple. At least to start with, obviously it, it is not perfect. It, there are some drawbacks we we'll go through them, but uh, generally the tool is very very uh, well uh, de developed. It is quite a new one, so the tool was just started in 2012, in 2015, so three years later it was acquired by uh, Red Hat uh, into the Red Hat Ansible, how it is called right now, due to uh, its popularity across the uh, IT community. So the Ansible, why it is so popular, right? So it has a lot of features, we'll speak about this in a couple of minutes, which allows you to deploy a lot of uh, interesting uh, scenarios because it's touching really various parts of the whole uh, IT ecosystem. It touches service, it touches application, it touches clouds, it touches the network devices, it touches the management of even like files, services within the operation system. So it allows you to create entry pipeline for your services. 
it's available on the all of the current platforms, so on Windows and Mac, uh, on Linux. Obviously, there are some preferences for the people who is using what, but um, again, as um, the Ansible is very uh, uh, capable on the backend and in terms of touching the network domain, the same it's uh, capable to be run on multiple environments. And uh, it is very user friendly. Um, it, it is written in the YAML, so it is sort of even, um, we don't need to know the programming to start working with the answer. We just need to have common sense of understanding what is going on, how you would like to structure your, uh, your activity, the service that you would like to implement, and uh, support it with uh, proper models. So the, all the information from the Ansible is located, I mean, from the documentation wise, is located on the webpage uh, uh, docs.ansible.com. We'll touch this page a bit later when we're speaking about the Nokia model, so what uh, Ansible is doing with the Nokia itself. Um, so why Nokia is so popular? I will briefly touch it. But it has in reality so many models that it covers, I think, if not all, but vast majority of the IT cases. Uh, from the pro pure number perspective, more than 3,000, I think about 3,200 models. And each of these models are touching uh, various components from something that's touching big to something that is touching small. Ansible is an open source, so that's why everyone who has some sort of programming skills could contribute to Ansible development if he or she feels enough power. On the other hand, it means that there is no drawback or hidden uh, uh, like trillions or whatever because uh, you can take a look on this code. The code is verified before it's implemented, I mean, before it's added um, into the major trail. And uh, it makes, uh, uh, from my perspective, the open source is, is, is the best like uh, uh, protection against any sort of malware that are uh, hidden some on the proprietary code. Ansible uh, is, is free of charge. However, there are multiple models and that is, uh, I think, why Ansible is popular as well. So it's free of charge. The core models, something is called Ansible Core, or generally Ansible. Uh, this is all these models that are used to manage the network element, service, clouds, application, etc. However, um, Ansible belongs to the Red Hat, and uh, Red Hat, uh, obviously, that it's developing uh, and Red Hat Linux, which is enterprise, which is which has paid support and so on. Same as for the Ansible, the Red Hat could provide the paid support for the company, like developing of the models if the company requires something, or um, generic support uh, uh, with the certain models if company is not um, willing to take the risk. Um, in addition, there is a, a something called Ansible Tower. So Ansible Tower is a sort of orchestration for the Ansible, which allows to uh, manage the um, created Ansible scripts in the way uh, that there are some sort of roles, like who is allowed to launch certain script, who is not, uh, storage of the credentials, integration uh, with LDAP or any other um, centralized controller, which allows uh, to uh, like store the credentials safely. Uh, this uh, tool is Ansible Tower is also uh, paid. There is, uh, on the other hand, the free of charge. Um, tool called AWX, so it's uh, like community version of their uh, tower, which has a lot of um, commonalities, however, uh, with the tower, however, it has less uh, functionality just to make Ansible Tower uh, still uh, interesting. Um, what else good about Ansible, especially when you're starting, and actually not only when you're starting, during your journey as well, uh, the Ansible is very popular across the world, and that's why there is a lot of community. And once you start, uh, like, um, stopping some way, like, when to execute the script, you see something's not working on, um, you start looking some on the internet, right? One of the most popular um, web pages uh, or web resources in this direction is uh, Stack Overflow or Stack Exchange, where you could, in the 90 95% all define the answer to your question. Not all the time, perhaps you're uh, lucky enough to find something new. Generally, um, from my experience, almost all the problems that I was facing uh, was uh, already somehow covered. I think from my experience over the uh, five years, just only one or two cases I was open on the GitHub against the 
um, certain modules where I was really start getting some word stuff and was not able to solve using the provided uh, workarounds. And the last but not least, uh, the Ansible is agentless. And the latter is particularly important for the network automation. The agent list means that you don't need to install anything on the end device where, uh, which is controlled by the Ansible. Uh, if you are a bit familiar with some other um, tools like uh, SaltStack, uh, generally SaltStack requires that you install something on uh, destination devices. There are options how you could avoid it, some like uh, salt minions and soil. In the Ansible, by default, you don't need to install. That's why um, their processing is done locally on the host uh, that has uh, Ansible installed, which allows you that which allows you to manage all sorts of network elements like Nokia, where you cannot install anything in the Nokia device like Ansible and whatsoever, just not necessary. Uh, your Ansible host will connect to the Nokia device, will do locally all the necessary computation, processing, and whatsoever send it to the device, get some feedback, again, register, process, and go further. Um, from the architectural perspective, so we briefly highlighted um, uh, before the, the generic outlook of the uh, Ansible logic, so not the Ansible, generic about the automation logic, and um, the uh, central component automatic logic is something that is uh, getting some different requests or getting some uh, outputs, requesting all other components. So um, from the perspective of the uh, Ansible, it uh, could help us with two major tasks. The first one is information collection. So Ansible has multiple plugins for multiple vendors, for Nokia as well, uh, like CLI or CMP or um, uh, NetConf, we'll speak about a bit later about what types of really uh, interface device right now. So all in all, to provide all these interfaces, so it would allow to collect the data from the network elements. So when the data is collected, it's stored in the memory, it could be processed on various ways, so you could use uh, built-in Ginger support in the Ansible, which is very powerful template in language, so it's a separate language, but Ansible um, relies on it a lot. So do the necessary processing, change the format of the information, how it was collected to put in a different uh, format, different uh, framework, and uh, send uh, the data somewhere. Ansible also call, can call the Python, um, but Ansible itself is written in Python, so that's why it has a lot of all the models to be used as a separate Python programs, could be used in the Ansible directly, or it could additionally also run any external script and uh, it has um, specific models to interact uh, with the other world, like to push data towards the REST API uh, based on the information that was collected uh, in the network, or pushing the information of the SOAP XML, again, based on the information that was collected in the network, uh, as well as just storing information somewhere locally in sort of uh, uh, text files or tables, uh, whatsoever, which allow, because, even in like 2020, the people are still relying on the service providers a lot on the, um, all sorts of uh, CSV tables. And there is nothing bad about this because it is very easy to say, okay, everybody needs to deploy the application fully API driven, containerized and so on and so forth. But on the other hand, uh, and that is I think um, one of the advantages of the Ansible, it could work with any input, with any output. So, Meaning if the customer requires that you send information through the REST API somewhere, no problem. It is there. It's required that information that is collected to the network stored as a table, like CSV or whatever, somewhere, it's not a problem. And uh, this gives a flexibility uh, which eases the start. So it does not require the work of all the backend of the system that the company has. It, flexible enough to work with almost any sort of uh, backend that exists. Obviously, it would require different uh, level of the efforts needs to be put into the development of the Ansible script, but generally it would work. Um, you see right now the arrows change their direction, but the first thing that we were speaking about, collection of the information that we have, so all sort of uh, CLI outputs, 
or uh, net for net data in the net confian models or um, um, rest information with devices for the rest this information was uh, taken up to the databases here we speak other way around so we could take again different input from table from shop XML, from rest api processes info into internal variables which ansible could operate with take some ginger take some python take whatever is necessary to uh, create some meaningful output and by meaning output i mean the um, proper sequence of the cli comments if we have to manage the devices over the cli or a uh, proper xml body if we manage device using the netconf uh, proper json file if we manage device of the rentconf uh, unfortunately yet ansible does not support grpc uh, and as far as i got when i was preparing this presentation for you the ansible would have grpc support not very soon i mean at least in the official trail uh, it was proposed actually recently by one of the Nokia engineers but from what I have uh, read on the GitHub, it, will, it, it is not planned even to include in, in Ansible 2.10. Right now, the latest Ansible release in 2.9.3. So therefore, I think it would uh, take, unfortunately, some time before Ansible would be working with GRPC. So that's why the main interface is how we interact with Intel elements so far, is CLI, NetConf, and for devices supporting um, in our RESTConf, then RESTConf. So, we have done a brief introduction into the Ansible. Uh, now let's take a look uh, more precisely. We were speaking about general write automation, Ansible at our uh, uh, webinar today is called the Ansible and Nokia. So what Ansible can do for Nokia? The first thing what Ansible could do for Nokia is the management of the network elements using the CLI. We'll talk about them more precisely today with the examples because CLI still is one of the most widely used interfaces. And I don't, do not foresee that in some more um, like meaningful future, it will be completely replaced by the net point for GRPC or whatsoever. And one of the reasons actually why CLI is still so popular with Nokia, because still the latest dates, uh, there were no officially published um, Nokia uh, yeah, models. Officially, at least from what I have understand, they were uh, published uh, in the last October when the software release uh, of SRS 19.10 uh, was uh, released. Till that time, uh, per contact with the Nokia sales, it was possible to obtain the YAN models. However, there was always recommendation uh, if you use uh, YAN models, so it's up to you because they're not confirmed to be 100% it, it's not confirmed that they have 100% parity with the CLI. And that is why, uh, obviously, you could use it, but uh, it's, it's not something that is 100% officially supported. So I think as Nokia has finally published uh, them on the Nokia GitHub page, they're like uh, giving more trust uh, uh, to their young. So, and that was one of the reasons why uh, NetConf with Nokia was still somewhat uh, delayed. Um, another point uh, why CLI is still very popular, when we think about a lot of uh, search provider within the Europe, I think the US might be similar, but I'm not very familiar with their market. There are a lot of devices, uh, old devices like 7705 or 7710, oh, sorry, 7210, I mean, sort of the devices that are already like uh, 10 years old and uh, which are already on the line and will never have any sort of network. Does it mean that these devices should not be automated? I don't think so. I think they can be and they should be. On the other hand, it means that they, these devices won't be able uh, to be automated with the um, netconf and that's why we still rely on sort of CLI automation. So what exactly Nokia could do uh, sorry, Ansible could do for us, I mean for the Nokia routers. Um, Nokia could uh, be configured using specific Ansible models which uh, allows either to collect the data from the network uh, devices using the CLI and then process this data somehow or to configure network uh, elements using the CLI so that their uh, devices are uh, getting the information uh, from our uh, controller. So, 
In this constellation, the Ansible could work with any sort of the local configuration file. It could still work with the SOAP or XML if it's necessary, if the data for the network and planning or documentation is stored somewhere. Um, how it's working, as said, so uh, there are specific models and we will uh, talk for them about more precisely today about them. Some time ago, actually, it's looking on the date, it's not like said some time ago, so more than three years ago, when the uh, Ansible get the first time, it was I think Ansible 2.2 when the Ansible starts supporting Nokia. I was writing, was written some articles about uh, they using Ansible for the Nokia. So long ago, I was still working in the Nokia myself. Uh, but um, uh, there was a time when the Ansible, start, Ansible at the time was supporting only uh, Cisco and Juniper, or mainly Cisco and Juniper, and, and, and the support of the Nokia was sort of foul in Nokia speaking community. And per discussion with some of the Nokia teamies, so uh, we have created uh, this an article that explains how to start using, even in those time, um, Nokia and Ansible together. Another opportunity that um, NetConf provides us is, uh, sorry, Ansible provides us is a NetConf. So uh, NetConf is a protocol that uh, I think these days is one of the most popular when people speak about the programmability. So it's based still on the SSH, internally it has an XML framing and uh, it allows to manage the network element in the persistent way. So in the, one of the drawbacks about the CLI uh, driven configuration management is that you need to have a very strict sequence of the CLI commands in order to have proper output. Whereas in the XML is uh, less uh, um, affected by the, uh, by, by, by the sequence of the uh, command that you are sending because just part of the data model. It allows you to make the configuration more pers uh, persistent in terms of how to configuration end and also how to configuration modify or remove. And this makes it perfect choice for integration of network elements with any sort of network controller, either Nokia native or third party, uh, but uh, relying on the net of interface. So same as with the CLI based approach, it allows us to manage our devices uh, in a persistent way. So um, NetConf actually exists also for, for quite a long in the Nokia. So the original Nokia uh, Young Models was called Alcatel Lucent R13, which highlighted that it was coming yet from the r 13 years. Uh, so namely like three, four, five years ago. Then um, the support was going in general with the Nokia uh, NetConf uh, uh, father. So, if I do remember correctly, roughly from uh, 15 or 16, I think from 16, if I do remember correctly, there was a new uh, Nokia uh, Young Models introduced, so it's completely reworked um, comparing to the previous one. So one of the main reasons was because in uh, version 16, Nokia has changed the approach to the CLI and has introduced something model driven, uh, something calling model driven CLI. We'll touch you about uh, model driven CLI also about it today because it has, um, in, it's, it has affected a lot how the devices uh, that were previously managed with the Ansible needs to be managed with the Ansible right now. And uh, um, this new model driven CLI has internal different structure comparing to the 15 and 14. So, and the original young uh, models were following the CLI structure of the 14s, or 13s, 14s, 15s uh, configuration, uh, configuration lines. And the, uh, since 16, they are, and they are still in the devices, both of the um, uh, young models are supported. So, it supported both legacy and the accurate ones. So, legacy is called out of the loose or sorting, new is called just Nokia. Nokia has also support uh, since um, since some years the open config data model. Again, the support of the open config it's sort of vendor natural um, uh, young models. Um, unfortunately, there is no uh, not all the thing that's possible to configure with the native models. It's possible to configure with um, open config models. There is a reason for that because open config was built for specific for specific reason by specific companies. Um, but I think as Nokia has open config support, so Nokia is either willing to get into this business or already has gotten the business where open config is used. 
and from what uh, we, uh, or how we are dealing with the NetConf, there are a couple of NetConf models, uh, which allows us to interact with the network elements. So it's both in the way to provide the configuration, in the way to um, take the configuration of all operational data from the device and process it and process it further. So you, also, you see on all, uh, on almost each and every slide some links which shown to you either to a blog where uh, we was writing about a particular topic so that you could if you're interested in uh, read for more information or uh, in some github this showing how we have used this as a particular um, uh, tool in context of the Nokia so that's why whatever you would see uh, we explained here you might see some uh, more information in our blog and the last but not least uh, is REST API. So um, the REST API is one of the most popular and I think de facto standards of interaction of application between each others. Uh, it relies a lot on the uh, HTTP. So basically it's HTTP based. It uh, uses HTTP requests, like post, get, put, delete, and so on and so forth. So um, the network elements uh, natively does not support REST API. I mean, from the Nokia at least. Uh, they do support NetConf, they do support the uh, CLI, and they do support GRPC, but about GRPC we have already talked. However, if you are creating the Ansible not just to work with the local files that you need somehow to provide, like CSV or whatever else, but rather you works with the integration of the Ansible uh, to the existing databases rest api allows you to uh, connect your ansible to your database so that all this rest api could extract the data like variables such as ip addresses interfaces name, names of interface interface uh, whether utilized or not at least from the planning wise uh, raw targets bgps number um, i2s uh, or spf areas links labels whatsoever so basically everything that you need to have to configure your network element, depending on how vast is your database, you could extract through REST API. The Ansible has a specific model which allows you to get the info uh, from uh, those devices. You could take a look in our blog also all the details about the REST API, how to use it, also including Ansible for various operations like uh, five most popular operation, get, post, put, patch, and delete. So if you're interested in this, uh, take a look there and you will um, yeah, have more inputs. So the brief introduction about the um, uh, Ansible and Nokia is done and now we'll start working, uh, looking more into the details how does it particularly works in the uh, Ansible and Nokia together. If you are familiar with the Ansible I think this slide would be quite easy for you. If you are not very familiar, I think it would be interesting. So, generically, uh, assuming that you have a Linux host where you could uh, install the Ansible, the Ansible is installing uh, using the standard packaging system. So, if you're you having a CentOS, you just would install it using uh, Suryam install Ansible, and the latest stable release would be installed. If you're using the Debian based like Ubuntu or Debian, you would need to use a uh, uh, sort of apt get install Ansible. However, to install the latest software release, you need to verify on the web page of the Ansible how you install it properly. Because by default, uh, if you use apt get, it install quite a legacy one, put it for with five if I do remember correctly. Um, uh, obviously, for any other distributive like Fedora or the new CentOS 8 or Red Hat 7, you need to also change um, a bit of the Instead of you using GFM, so basically the uh, the installer or the package manager system that's used in this system. You could also install it using PAP, so Python installer, but we put it outside because we don't uh, focus on the Python in this uh, webinar today. So from the Ansible perspective, uh, you need to have a like at least a minimum configuration which, which would allow you to start working. The first one is a configuration file. Uh, on the etc Ansible, uh, Ansible CFG. So this file contains all the information how your Ansible should work, including the past to the host, uh, which is inventory file, including the parameters of the plugin that is used by the Ansible, such as a uh, SSH plugin, um, 
parameter which is used to uh, establish SSH session to the devices and so on and so forth. So generally, if we speak about the um, like development environment, the default configuration are okay. If you speak about the production environment, um, and the vast majority of the parameters would be dependent on the environment you have, and they will be also driven by the security environment, which is allowed uh, to be in your network or what is not, and depending on this, you will uh, structure the uh, information within your configuration file. The second uh, important uh, file is inventory. So by default, it is handled in the uh, file etc and civil costs. And, and the simplest version just uh, would have a category, whatever the category is. And um, within the category would have a uh, host names. So Ansible operates in kernel with the host names. However, uh, the device, the host where you do develop, deploy Ansible uh, needs to know how to connect to these various um, elements. And uh, obviously there are multiple ways. Uh, the most simple one, if you do not have, well, the most simple one, if you have all of the running DNS in your system, uh, and you just then need to provide within the ETC and the host, the host name, how they are resolved in the DNS. If you don't have DNS up and running, uh, the next simple step would be to modify your ETC hosts, so local bindings, uh, to the um, IP addresses of the host names, which are defined in your host files. So basically, Ansible would internally call X01, and the host would resolve using the etc hosts uh, x01 to a certain IP address and would connect to the device using this IP address. And the third, I think, um, the most important uh, part is the playbook. So basically, this is your script, this is your logic, what you want to do with the network. It has a certain structure. We'll take a look in a couple of minutes on it. However, uh, generically, it um, contains uh, the name of the the name, how, what exactly you are doing in these tasks. We have a certain um, uh, definition which hosts you are going to contact to. You will uh, have um, so the information about uh, which type of plugin you would like to use to connect, uh, and uh, finally the task. So exactly what you are doing uh, with your network. So from the structure, as I said, so on the top, something is called header statement. So it, it has uh, the first uh, I entry column typically hosts. This is a mandatory entry because it tells what is the group of the devices that you would like uh, to send it to. It might contain here either a particular host name and the host name needs to be designed within your um, host files or it must have also a name of the group. So like here, it was not here. It was one of the groups in this file. So that's why it's containing all the devices. How you group, how you create, it's entirely up to you, just um, um, like arbitrary text field, but this arbitrary text field would either uh, match into the group name in the ETC host or to the host name into the ETC host. So that script understands against which devices it should be working. Uh, the second big part is the tasks. Uh, the tasks provide the information, uh, the, the action themselves. So what are you going to do on these tasks are built on a specific model. So each and every specific model has a certain parameters. So like you see, in this case, we have a, a model called SRS commons. So as you might understand from the name, SRS stands for uh, Nokia SROS. And everything what we have internally indented, so called, uh, are the arguments which are taken uh, into this model and then input um, to work. So, um, if you take a look on the Ansible web page, so what do we have there? Uh, for the Nokia, we have uh, three models. Actually, uh, I have never used the one called SRS rollback. However, the first two uh, I have used a lot myself in the labs, in the live uh, network, and uh, we will focus on these uh, two models uh, today. So uh, let's take this link. Uh, this link is uh, yeah, providing us pass uh, to the uh, information that you have seen on this web page. Open it here. So we'll go to it's this web page, as you see, it is uh, docs.ansible.com. 
functions that I was showing you previously. So it's contained all the information. We need to go within the Ansible project to the tab called Network Models. Inside uh, this uh, network uh, models, you might see that the devices are structured in the host names, uh, sorry, in the name of the vendor. So um, let me take here some network models. Uh, And uh, in this field, we would like to search for SRS. So once we go to the SRS, it's, you see these two models. So command and config. Let's take uh, a look in the beginning on the SRS command. So that's the description. So it tells us that the model is called SRS commands. It allows us to run divide their, um, some configuration on their remote device. So uh, um, it explains and provides some further information. That's something that we typically send to the de de device and get the results that we would like to read from, like any show comments with debug or whatsoever. If you'd like to configure something, we would need to go to SRS config. So we'll touch this one a bit later when we start speaking about the SRS config. So you might see here all the parameters that are associated with this model. It tells us what are required. Uh, if you don't think what's required, meaning it's not necessary to have it. And uh, if there is a certain uh, like uh, uh, default parameters associated, it will also be provided here. And on the right side, we have a detailed explanation what uh, this or those uh, parameter is uh, doing. It also has uh, typically um, some sort of the uh, examples showing what is working, what is uh, not working properly, like uh, how to run uh, some command, how to run another command, and uh, it, it, it tells exactly what this um, um, task is supposed to do. So this information is typically uh, very useful, especially when you start your journey because it gives you, it doesn't provide though you the output, but at least uh, gives you the idea how you could structure um, your task. So once we will be doing demo today, you will see for how we are using this stuff. Um, some ideas from, um, from the experience that uh, I was using Ansible for uh, what you could do when you do these things. So you could collect any sort of information from the device. So basically anything that you could get as a show, like show router interface, to show, uh, show router plan, show code, show version, show chassis, show whatever, uh, you could uh, collect um, using this model. Once you collect this information, you're getting to the end, so you're getting the, uh, just as a text, so text field. Um, Ansible has a specific uh, models which is, allows you to uh, process this uh, text, so just a um, string, so the text, and to extract necessary information and this information that you are extracting to put into the certain uh, form. So basically, you, you might take the output using multiple show comments from the device, uh, then part this text and create the data model of your device. Um, even if we speak about the CLI, not about the netconf, it doesn't mean that we cannot speak about the data model. The so data model generically is a data structure, how you structure your keys without your um, uh, device and what are the really were sitting with the case. That's why we could take the data model, not can native and use the same uh, data model was for uh, CLI and uh, for uh, netconf if you like, or we could use a completely different data model which exists in our uh, documentation tool and what's here. So long story short, we could collect information from the data, uh, there from the devices, we could process this data in short that we are creating this data tree of the information that we have collected. And then uh, we could create a sort of uh, diff report which allows you to uh, compare the data that you have collected against a um, uh, certain intent. So against a certain baseline. So uh, for example, so once you start building the device uh, in the live network, you would have it documented somewhere in, in 
documentation system. In the documentation system, you would have a device would have this card. The device would have uh, this uh, MDA installed in this card. So this amount of reports. Um, and um, once you get the device uh, on the site, you start configuring them, and then you could uh, compare, or even before you start configuration, you might want to compare whether the hardware that's installed in the device uh, matches what is planned or whether it is not. And uh, you could either like visually, uh, I mean, with your eyes, um, compare this, or you could use Ansible for this. Um, as briefly told, so this is RS config model, uh, the sorry, SRS command model, which is a perfect one. So it allows you in one run uh, to collect the information about multiple show commands, to put this information together, and uh, you could work further with this text. So I'll show you right now the first demo, which uh, actually implement the workflow that we have just shared. So we would collect some information from the network elements. We would uh, uh, then uh, analyze or compare this information that we have collected against something uh, that we have like an intent. And based on this, we would uh, generate a uh, like diff uh, analysis. So I have prepared a, a simple lab for you. Uh, let me show it. Uh, so there, this is a topology of our lab. So as you might uh, see, we have uh, three routers. So it's a, a, a virtual routers running in the VSIM uh, mode. So each uh, device is configured as SR1. So it is a single uh, VM virtual machine. Uh, in terms of what is installed internally, it has a IOM1 card with ME6. So it's one of the um, like topologies that they typically use for uh, multiple things. So each of uh, these uh, devices uh, have um, two working ports, um, like one port on, um, on each of the uh, interfaces. So uh, you might uh, see uh, here how does it look like. So we have uh, two physical interfaces. So in the uh, like first uh, connection breakout port and the second connection breakout port, uh, based on the fact that uh, we are as a, a basis for our lab uh, running direct KVM, uh, despite that we are making breakout port, we cannot um, have uh, more, uh, we cannot use any phase of breakout interface basically. So we only, could use all time within out of four breakout only one interface. So it doesn't matter, I mean, for us, it is a lab, uh, we could uh, deploy anything we would like to. So three devices has uh, exactly uh, same um, uh, physical setup. So let's collect, uh, connect to any uh, of uh, these uh, devices. So I haven't provided the, uh, the devices has a standard configuration. So uh, we have only uh, their uh, management IP addresses that were uh, in installed uh, on them uh, during their uh, creation of VM. So, uh, so we're inside. What we could do right now, we could take a look what the version. So we are running the um, uh, Nokia um, 20 version. I mean, it doesn't matter. We are working with slide. We could run generally any RV2 version. So starting from 13 and uh, perhaps, I don't know actually if 13 is yet supported by 14, 15, 16, whatever, um, we could have up and running. So if you take a look for uh, uh, chances, we would see that this exactly this device SR1 uh, and uh, this is standalone. We don't have any host name yet configured with easy SIM. Um, we could take a look on the card. So uh, we have a card, it's not provisioned, so device just, has booted, so it doesn't have anything um, installed on top. Absolutely fresh, fresh and virgin. If you make a something like show port, obviously we wouldn't say anything besides the uh, ports on the, um, our uh, device, just because we do not uh, have anything, um, um, any MDAs and any card yet provisioned. So um, the same, uh, would be for any other device. So let's connect to another device. So uh, 
you see also default host name, no host name configured. We take a look show version, same software version, and uh, um, let's say show chassis, same um, device um, type. So uh, 7750 SR1. Um, yeah, so basically, as you see, uh, same configuration default, nothing is configured at all. Uh, so that is one part. So, uh, and we assume uh, we would like to collect the information aside from the devices and compare it with the intent. So the intent uh, that we have, I could show it to you here. So the device intent uh, tells us, I mean, it has some arbitrary data model. I was just thinking what would be uh, interesting for you to show from, I mean, some real examples on the other hand, uh, some something interesting and uh, not super time consuming. So the device intent uh, contains, um, if you like, the output how the device should look like when it is provisioned. So the version should be 22.r1. The device type should be 77.r1. There, uh, it, it should have two cards. So the first uh, card should be IM1 uh, uh, in the profile HE and. Um, the second is our CPM, so it should be CPM1. It must be up and active. So that is how the device is supposed to look like once uh, this is uh, uh, provisioned. Um, uh, we haven't, as you see, provisioned uh, anything yet. So uh, we we'll create, uh, or we have created as part of the preparation uh, two uh, major files. So the first one is called, uh, oh, sorry, Classic collect. So uh, classic all because it is oriented for the uh, classic uh, CLI. Their default CLI uh, mode where the device is put it to. And uh, sorry, I think it is a uh, config. So classic check. So um, what does uh, this uh, device, uh, what this playbook does? So it uh, would collect from their host names, uh, from their host group called Nokia. So it contains all these three devices that uh, we have in our lab. So this device, this device, and this device. From these devices, I use the connection plugin network CLI. So it's a uh, plugin that is required, um, recommended by the Ansible uh, to be used to manage the modeling of elements um, and without connecting any facts. So we don't try to connect the device to collect some data up front. We run the following task. First task is using the SRS command model, we would like to collect three pieces of information. So first piece of information, we would like to collect the show version. So something uh, that uh, we just have seen when it was collecting show version there, collecting the software version of the device. Uh, uh, show chassis something uh, containing information about what type of devices we are running. So that is 750 and so on. And uh, show card, which contains information about the cards, their slots, and their uh, information whether their card is provisioned or not. So using a keyword register, we would like to save their output of the uh, comments that we are uh, requesting from the device because by default the nothing is saved. And one, this data is saved. We are using the specific, uh, another model called template, which allows us to work with a Jinja template. So uh, what templates is doing, uh, the templates, uh, this template is taking the original information that we have collected from the device and using template uh, in the past, templates classic check G2 would generate a certain uh, file with uh, uh, some data that we have collected from the device. Let's take a look on this uh, template. Uh, let's see. Sure. So uh, the template is uh, written in the Jinja language, so it is uh, quite an extensive one. So um, it uh, has all the capability of the standard uh, scripting language. However, it's called not scripting, it is templating language. So it has possibility, uh, capability for all the four, uh, four loops, if conditionals, 
Um, it has uh, support for built-in support functions, so which is allows us to process the text uh, basically in the way that we are uh, collecting from the device and what we are doing here. So we, uh, from the show output, you see here is called the variable and the show output, this is the name how to do this, we have called it internally in the Ansible. So in the, uh, some of the sub keys of this um, tool, we are start basically for line by line analyzing all the information that we have collected from the device been on our data model. So our data model will start with something called device real. You remember in the intent we have the name device intent. Here we have a device real. And uh, we uh, start looking in the first output, uh, we have a show um, version command. So we are looking for the corresponding line. So the line that should kind of, uh, contain the timer's key. And uh, we are parsing this line in the proper way so that we could split uh, subtract from the whole text that we have uh, the proper name of the command. So working with automation is a, is a programming. In programming, in vast majority of the cases, it's working with the text. Not all the obviously time, but in a lot. And um, we are looking for a proper value within the uh, output. We subtract in this value and we put it in this data model so to the key version. The next one, um, we are looking for uh, something containing the name. So we have the host name as part of our data model and we are looking in the output of the uh, show chassis. It contains the, uh, the keyword name, which equals to the host name. So we're looking for the line containing the name. And once we have found the line, we are splitting this line uh, using a, it's quite a complex scenario, but uh, what the financial uh, we mean, so we, uh, we uh, split this line into the um, multiple uh, uh, elements. So we're creating a sort of list. And then out of this list, we take the element with the proper name. So why we're splitting it in the list? Because uh, that's one of the most convenient way of working with the, um, uh, of the, uh, of the lists. So we are finding the proper uh, element. So, and putting it uh, into our data model. The same trick we are doing for the type of the device. So we are looking for the, uh, for the proper device entry and we put this information there. Afterwards, in the last uh, uh, comment, uh, the comment we are just controlling by this index tab, we are uh, creating the key uh, associated with the install the devices uh, card. So we are looking for the device card in the output. We are looking then uh, for a uh, uh, text that uh, we have in the show card output and uh, parse it in the way that we could create the data model similar to something that we have in our intent. So we do need it for the, the cards that are not provisioned and for the card that are up. Obviously, uh, I was just tailoring this example for our use case today, but you might have here much more additional uh, conditions, uh, um, nested condition, matching exactly uh, your scenario or other way around, making your scenario as flexible as possible so that you could uh, cover all type of use cases uh, that are um, uh, running in front of you. And I think that is one of the most important things that you need to know about automation. There is no automation for everything. Automation, uh, on, on the one hand, uh, you'll have an automation and the another will have flexibility. And, Automation doesn't mean that you could solve all the problems. Some automation means that you could quickly solve a uh, vast majority of the problems that uh, you have clearly defined. Um, that is why, and I don't think it makes sense to create an automation for, for like each and every uh, smallest case because you might end up creating the, a lot of unnecessary efforts, a lot of unnecessary code for something. It's quite an easy, uh, solvable manually. I mean, um, even if it's not solvable um, manually easy, it's solvable manually and the time that you spend to solve it manually will be much, much uh, less comparing that you need to create a complex automation around. I mean, anyway, that's a standard automation dilemma. So that's why we have tell our Discord for our particular example, but it, it's good enough that you could uh, build something out of that if you like it. So that is all in all, what our, our first uh, template is doing. So basically it's uh, generate out of uh, collected information. 
uh, it generates um, uh, for us the data model uh, that is uh, following this tree. So it should uh, follow the uh, device intent, version, system uh, type, cards, and uh, you also have a check of the host name. You don't have host name in this device just because it's device intent. However, we host uh, we have our host name in our uh, Ansible host. How we are running the Ansible host, uh, so which where we have mapping um, between our IP addresses and between our host names. So we have covered so far uh, this point. So. We have created in a nutshell, uh, or we are creating the YAML file. YAML file, uh, Ansible is built and everything is written in the YAML. So it just file in the, uh, which if it is imported as variables, is effectively the data model uh, with the variables that we could work. Um, and um, after we have generated this file, we are uh, creating the, uh, so we are importing this uh, file as variables within our Ansible. We also import their uh, intent. So something that we would like to uh, run the diff analysis against. So we have these two variables. And uh, the last uh, task in our playbook, make sure that we compare one, um, to one created data model with another one that is sort of intent. So how it is supposed to do. And uh, generates uh, the diff report. Uh, which says whether their information in our device intent and host names all together are uh, matching to the something that we have uh, taken from our network devices. Let's take a look for this second template, so or diff analysis. So it's uh, it's a bit huge, but uh, it is uh, written in the same uh, Jinja language. So it's one once you understand how to deal with Jinja. You could use it almost anywhere in the Ansible. You and what we are doing here, we are comparing. So, if device intent first, so basically everything that we have in device intent, we compare into the device real. So, device real is how it is called from what we collect from the live network, and device intent something that we do uh, have uh, in uh, our intent. If the value are uh, matching. Our check is okay, so result pass, okay, whatever. If not, then not. And if it is not, we provide the information uh, about the keys that we are matching, just to highlight for the someone who would be uh, looking through uh, their reports. I mean, obviously, as we're generating these reports, we, any sort of reports are generated for, for humans, because if you would like to do something automatically, we could just could take this uh, on this comparison sort of action, like, uh, update the software on the remote uh, device by sending there like certain commands, copy the file from a certain link, download, update the software. So that's why the reports are for humans and as the reports are for humans, we would immediately provide their additional information. So in this case, we provide this uh, version of the real device and, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the, uh, yes, the real device and the how it should be, providing the key in the keys as is or to be. Again, it's something that was just my imagination, how I would uh, structure it uh, for myself when I need to use it, and how actually I'm structuring it for myself when I'm writing sort of uh, such reports for uh, network verification. Uh, then we have here further check, checking the host names, uh, checking the device types, uh, checking the uh, slot so basically everything that we have in our uh, device models we compare once against another one and uh, that is what we are running for each and every uh, device we have in our topology so we are running collection information from each device we are running the creation of data model from each and every device we are running the uh, uh, diff analysis for each and every device so um, that's our the first uh, playbook. Let's uh, run it. So we run playbook using Ansible playbook, and then we provide the uh, classical uh, the name of the playbook for for the first time we are running the classical check. So uh, it starts collecting the information from the devices. You see directly in the output what's going on. So 
so I think I need to uh, remove the created the results. So let me remove them. And I will run. So now we uh, don't have anything in the results. Now we are rerunning our playbook. So it's running fresh. Just collecting the data from the network element. It creates the file with these data models. It imports the files from data models, it imports the intent, and it makes the diff analysis. So now if you take a look for the result uh, folder, so it's a folder where we uh, store both our data and our reports. Let's start with them. taking a look on our uh, collected data. Uh, so let's say um, BSR11 uh, data. So you see that we have collected from the uh, real network device. So the text was properly parsed by getting the software version. Uh, we are getting their host name. How does it in reality support on the device? By getting the type of the device from the uh, cards perspective, we say that we have IMHE. It, it is not provisioned. We have the CPM that is up and running. So if we do our manual analysis, so let's take a look in our um, uh, CLI. So if we complete, complete, uh, uh, compare it to the template, we would see that the version is okay so far, right? We don't have host name, but we understand that host name should be rather how to spot in the script. So we are 11, 12, 13, something, but definitely not a standard one. We have a proper um, type of the device. So uh, we also have a card name. So the card name are matching. However, the state is not. And um, that is why what we are doing here, then uh, looking for the third one, the car of the CPM is so far looks okay. So uh, the, the last task was generating this diff analysis. And if we take a look for this uh, diff analysis right now, so the file called report.txt, you see that the output in the following format. So the software version checked was so far okay. Their hosting was not okay because uh, the version of the, the name of the device is the same, whereas it should be this or 11 or something different. Device type is okay, slot A is okay, slot one is not because the device uh, is a card should be in the app state and it is not, it is in provision state. So we have created the first, uh, you start saying that the first like, benefit of automation. And I mean, this is very simple task, right? So just very fine with the first device. What you might add here, also adding um, information about the NDA, information about the port. Despite you wouldn't have it at the first glance, but you could create the proper template for a working router. Then just make your template uh, robust enough that it could handle uh, the missing information. and um, once uh, you create this, you could start testing it on the not configured device so that you could have a single uh, report and a single set of information collection, which will allow you to perform all the check, everything that you have on your own device. So that's the first step, right? So, uh, and uh, this step is generally helpful in, uh, in configuration management, but definitely helpful in the troubleshooting and all sorts of like accounting management and the performance management where you could collect various information and compare it to something and based on the compared information, uh, generate uh, some um, sort of their um, reports. So uh, the next step, once we have connected, collected this information, I mean, this step is self-contained by itself, but uh, we might do something extra. So the next step would be how we could configure information from the Nokia devices or how we can do some configuration of the Nokia devices. The workflow containing the information about something useful in the real life, you might want to um, uh, compare starting with the point we have uh, just uh, finished our previous uh, workflow. So once we have collected information, we have uh, created a different analysis. Uh, the next step would be that we could, as I said, uh, taking this diff analysis, is, the report is just for humans, but for the uh, uh, tool, what you might uh, have, if certain uh, comparison 
is not matching. So meaning if we need to, to do some corrective uh, step to move from okay, sorry, from move from not okay to okay state. So then we need to do some configuration. And uh, we might have a conditional uh, tasks in the ansible that allows us to do the certain configuration step if uh, something is missing. Obviously, as we are checking the software, um, well, it, it's not easy to change the software. We first of all need to have the proper software somewhere. We might have them um, uh, um, if we have a proper software, and that is a typical, uh, quite a, a popular case uh, in all the service provider data center enterprises. The devices that are shipped from the factory uh, to the real install typically has quite an old software. I mean, quite, um, it, you know, it's, it, it's very ambiguous work. In vast majority of cases, it has not this type of software that you have in your network, unless you have a specific agreement with the vendors that it will be shipped with the proper software. So that is why you might have the proper software somewhere within your network, and then, like on the TFTP server or, or FTP server, and then you would be able um, uh, to download it uh, using the script, so sending the proper comments, uh, like in our diff analysis. If software version is different to what is required, then we might have a specific task within our playbook that we say we would need to update the software on the device. So copy something uh, from um, uh, from your FTP server or TFTP HTTP server image to CF3, how the image will be called, then change configuration within the device, then reboot. You might have this part of your uh, of your playbook, uh, but. Uh, Obviously, we cannot change the device type. So if we have a device type uh, 77 SR1, and we speak not about the uh, virtual simulator, but rather real life, and most likely you would have a, you, you would have to deal with the device or on this, you will be understanding that for whatever reason, not the proper device would be shipped. Uh, all in all, uh, the, the last point that we have in our data, po data model is uh, configuration of the interfaces. And again, there are two simple. Either the first, we just verify that the proper uh, model is installed. I mean, proper part, proper MDA installed per our intake data model. Um, or we uh, need to change the configuration. So if device is not provisioned, like the card is not provisioned, we need to provision that. Based on this uh, different analysis, we could do these things. Okay, if we see that the cart is not provisioned, we need to provision it. So we need to send the proper set of the command to the device and it will be uh, provisioned then. And after we have defined what exactly actions we need to do, we just structure our playbook and send this information to the uh, devices in form of um, commands that we would like uh, to send. Um, the module that is used for this is the second one that uh, we was uh, looking into the uh, Ansible web page. It's called SRS config. So this model is um, uh, intended to create a configuration uh, in two uh, formats, in formats of lines, on the format of the fully created uh, sequence that is taken out of external file, and send this configuration to the network uh, element. So uh, we'll take a look at the basic example once we would have the lines, but uh, let me jump back for a moment back to our uh, web page. So if you take a look on the SRS config documentation, again, as with the SRS command, it provides all the details, what are the keys, what are the default values for keys, uh, what uh, keys are mandatory, what are not. And in the example, you might see that uh, there are like uh, different ways. So we could either structure everything just a single uh, command or, uh, but then we could send only one command or we would like to send uh, multiple comments in such a way or we could uh, structure it in a proper way going into the configuration context. So uh, configure and going through the um, elements and uh, Another way we could uh, provide the uh, file, the source file that should configure, uh, contain all the configuration lines that we would like to send uh, to the network element and all these configuration uh, lines will be sent, configuration uh, start uh, getting uh, used. So we'll take a look right now on the sale on the lines approach, just 
the most simple one, but still uh, showing you some exposure. So we go to our um, CLI and uh, to configure the devices, uh, we have a playbook called uh, Classic Config. So let's go inside. So uh, what we do here, uh, we uh, import their data from our file that we have collected in the previous task. So we collecting the data from the uh, collection and after processing uh, into the data model. And then once this is done, they're going to the first configuration task. So the first configuration task is to put the host name. Even if we change the host name of the device that are properly up and running, it's not a problem. However, what we might add here, uh, we might add uh, here additional um, check uh, by importing another our intent file and uh, adding here when if the configuration is not matching. So um, if the key is not matching, then uh, I mean the key of the inventory host name and then um, uh, what we have in our data model, then we will do this configuration. So in, in, in such a form, the first type would be um, conditional. So we could add it here right now. So uh, the specific uh, or the default uh, keyword that contains the host name, which is taken out of inventory is called inventory host name. Like right, it's, uh, it's collected or it is stored in the inventory file, um, and uh, it's hosting of our device. So we would say we would like to create this configuration when inventory host name. Uh, we use a standard uh, comparison stuff. So when we make this task conditional, does not equal something that we have in uh, device real. I think it's called device real host name, right? So it is for device real system host name. So basically if inventory host name doesn't equal this uh, value, so which we take in our um, key, then we would uh, run this task if it is matching that we don't run. So the second uh, task that we have, it's a bit uh, more complex. So we take add an input out of our data model. So we take a look for all the cards that we have in our data models and we have two. Uh, we create a loop and in in inside of this loop, we are looking if there is a key called state have a value on provision. So basically we are taking a look if the uh, key having state uh, in the key named state has a value on provision. So that would be true for this and would be false for this. So if this condition is true, we are running the uh, configuration which should um, change the uh, configuration of our card. So we'll take information out of our uh, data model father. So we take this information, this field, so key type. We split this uh, uh, value into two uh, pieces. So why are we splitting the two pieces? Because from configuration perspective, uh, the card itself is called IAM1 and HE is a level, how this card is look like. And that is why we need to split this uh, word in two and uh, send the uh, command saying that the card, what is the type of the card, IAM1 and the level of this card is HE. So this is the way how we are creating them uh, how we split this uh, file into uh, so this uh, key into pieces and tending this to the configuration line. Uh, and basically that's it, right? So we need to config, uh, um, fix two things uh, and uh, that is what we are doing. I mean, obviously uh, we might, uh, father has a, um, here, father uh, check. So uh, because if we don't have the second part, we don't need to run level which might be a case for certain cards. But 
At the first entry, you see that already using this uh, approach, you could create a quite a flexible uh, configuration of all your network elements. And uh, once uh, we would run this script, so Ansible Playbook Classic uh, Config. So it starts uh, importing the data, it's analyzing the data against the host name. So it, it's running the uh, provisioning of their first host name. You see that the status is changed, meaning the configuration was applied. Uh, for the uh, CLI, you see that we have two iterations. The first one was skipped because the state was up slash active and our task is running when it is unprovisioned, so when basically we need to provision the device. So uh, we could now go to the CLI and to check where the configuration was applied. However, that's again the beauty of our automation. What we could do right now, we could rerun our check command, uh, our check script that we have created. And um, so now what it's doing is you're doing the same thing that it was doing previously, but you see that uh, the, it, it generated the data set and right now again they are yellow, meaning something has changed in the file. So basically Ansible has a built-in function which uh, tells you whether there is a difference uh, between the file that is produced and the original one. And if there is a difference, then this uh, configuration is uh, a content of the file at least by one shot to exchange. So let's take a look, uh, first of all, into the generated uh, report, sorry, in generated data set, so data model, and then we take a look at the report. So we take a look to the results uh, data. We see that now we have uh, post name properly set, and we see that the device, uh, the card, uh, that are inserted properly in the device and the state up, so meaning it is uh, provisioned. If you take a look for the report, the now report is fine, but because our uh, intent configuration and our uh, real configuration from the device are absolutely uh, correct. Obviously, that's, I mean, the, the first simple step, but you could start multiplying it further by adding the MDA checks, uh, by adding the uh, port checks, by adding the route configuration. So all these things that is something that you could easily extend and create a handy tool for you for provision for all out of your network or for doing a certain configuration changes which allows you not only to push the configuration to the network but rather to push the configuration to the network then to collect the operational data and compare the state what you were sending to the device with what you see to the device to create a so-called assurance that the configuration you have implemented is accurate it is matching what you were to do, and uh, meaning there is no harm, but you have a properly working service. So uh, you have seen the studious cases, which I, I, I hope uh, were interesting for you, giving you some uh, ideas and where really Ansible you could start with if you have not started yet. But what's next? Obviously, this just a small bit, and uh, but. Is said so they are already starting with the first step. Um, the challenge that recently arised with such a port, I mean, it's fine if you have uh, created it for a certain um, software version, but um, one of the things with network automation that uh, their network operation system, they're not always stable. They're developing, they're developing some new feature, they're, de they're changing sometimes something. One of the big changes, I think, um, if you are working with the Nokia daily, you might have seen back in 2017, uh, the Nokia has uh, changed their CLI to a model-driven CLI. So model-driven CLI was introduced in software release 16.1, uh, 16 which is, was released in the May 2017. Oh, sorry, no, May 2018, I think. May 2018, yes. So to, roughly two years ago. and. Um, the model driven CLI has completely different structure. Model driven CLI has an implicit commit. So, uh, like if you are familiar with Cisco or SXR, you know that all the configuration you are providing there, you need to commit. In the Nokia, the commit function uh, will come in um, in the form of candidate config uh, back into the, I think, uh, 15, so SRS 15. 
but uh, in SRO 16, once the model-driven CLI uh, was introduced, uh, there is an opportunity to work either uh, with the classic CLI or with the model-driven CLI. And with the model-driven CLI, uh, the structure of the configuration command is um, a bit uh, different. So um, I'll jump back uh, to my lab for a couple of minutes and I will, so the configuration that I was doing here uh, was not uh, saved on the devices. So that's why I could go to any our um, routers that we have in the lab. Uh, let's say we'll go for uh, route number one. As you see the asterisk, the configuration is not saved. And uh, I could do an admin uh, reboot. So uh, it, it would just take a, a couple of minutes uh, for the device uh, to reboot. And uh, it will boot uh, back with a absolutely like a fresh new configuration. So the reason why I'm doing this, I'll go to the model driven uh, CLI uh, so that uh, you could uh, take uh, a look. We'll uh, start the pin here just to see that it is uh, booting. We'll go to the model CLI um, uh, mode and you will see that the configuration syntax is a bit, a bit changed. So uh, while it is looking, I will still further explain it. So um, well, it's actually, it was very good. Easy. Yeah, so um, another interesting thing, so as configuration was default and uh, the key was not set as a persistent. So uh, that is why uh, I need to, uh, to clean my SSH keys. So going back to the device, you see it's back called uh, vSIM. So show chases show the same device. So the show card, it is unconfigured. So we will change on this device uh, the mode, how it is operating. So we'll go to the model driven CLI. So configuration system management interface, uh, configuration mode, model driven. So uh, we log out. If you log in back, so we are getting to the uh, model driven CLI mode. So you see that our uh, what tell us that we are in the model driven CLI. At least you see this uh, square box, right? Where typically pass is provided. So, and if you do right now config, we are not getting anywhere because the configuration mode has changed, and. Um, if you would like to run right now our provisioning script, so uh, let's say we would uh, rerun, uh, let's start with a collection. Uh, so it start taking a look inside, but you see it has quickly collected the information from um, another devices, but uh, it cannot uh, collect anything uh, from our uh, device running in this CLI. So just cannot uh, collect the information, it will be timeout. So uh, let's do just a, a brief hack in our results, like what it was uh, collecting for with our 11 data. We will put that our host name is uh, Wisim. So to run the configuration of the host name, so we'll put a uh, Wisim here, and we would like to run the uh, classical uh, config. So the playbook that we're using for the configuration of the device. So it has imported the value. You see that it is starting doing the uh, configuration and it's supposed to configure the host name. Uh, let me uh, check this file back. So I'll put as this is uh, on provisioned. So we again run the provisioning, and you will see that it will change in the host name uh, one time. So I need to think explicitly take a look how to scope in the template. Uh, just a second, uh, templates, uh, different analysis. So we are matching to put not okay, the state that it is, uh, sorry. 
need enough, I think. I'll just go to the device, I think. I'll take a look there. So, um, okay, I think I need to take a look how this code in the device. So, what um, does it matter? So, uh, what's matter? So, you see, it's all the time trying to change the host name, and uh, their host name is uh, not, uh, sorry, I think it is called not for just a second. Oh, okay, I see the issue. Okay, I have put it into the uh, wrong place. So here we have IOM1HE. So it was typed from my side. So now we try to rerun the provision. Um, so host name must be changed. It tries to change the configuration. So like, but all the time it's changing the host name, which is strange. It's not changing the user host name for other devices. So if we go right now uh, to the device, uh, to this device, so uh, where we have changed the configuration uh, more to model driven, you see that uh, the key is not, the host name is not changed. And uh, the card, despite the tells us that configuration has changed, it is not changed. So the reason, because in order to get the configuration mode, the, the command is changed. So we need to have something like configuration global to get the configuration. And after we do any sort of changes, we need to make a commit. So if we don't make a commit, and if we don't uh, have a configuration global, we are not able to change the configuration. And that's exactly the solution for this thing. So you might have seen, um, 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 I, I was one of the first one to read, uh, to write the blog about modern doing CLI about the Nokia, so about these things. So the solution for you, if you're using running to manage the Nokia, would be to change the key or to change the statement con configure to configure global to allow you to get into the configuration model. And um, the second that after you did the configuration that you would like to have, you would need to add a commit keyword. So if we take a look uh, back in our example, so we take a look on their file called MD config. So it's model driven config. So what it's doing, it's adding everywhere the global keyword and commit, both for the host name and for um, interface. Uh, sorry, and on the card layer. So what we can do right now then, we could run Ansible playbook MD Config CLI, so it start configuring the, the configuration, the device. So it's failing for not uh, model driven devices because obviously they are not model driven devices. Doesn't know what model driven is, and uh, uh, it uh, has a sort of uh, information. Uh, and that second device, uh, which are model driven, it is configured. So if we take a look for the device right now. So we see that uh, host name is changed. So it is VSR and if you make a show card, so we see that the card is provisioned Can we start working on something like show um, MDA and so on and so forth. So that's the first thing that you need to, to be aware of when you're working with, uh, or where, when you are making the transition from the classical CLI to MD CLI and you have any sort of automation driven by the Ansible and some other in the world. So the second um, challenge would uh, arise with the uh, development of the automation, if you look a bit further, uh, for the NetConf area. So the NetConf is based around the XML. So, and, uh, being based around the XML, it has internally the XML body which needs to be properly structured. So you need to find a way how you could, using perhaps again the Jinja templates, create this XML body, fill it with the information, 
send it uh, to their device. So uh, the first thing is creating this XML. We need to understand how. Um, second, uh, you need to understand what are all the keys that you need to have, how to create the proper uh, ginger check. So if you don't have a certain key, so you don't put a, a part of the XML in place or other way around. If you have a certain key, you would like to put the interface around. And how you could extend it further, so uh, once you start adding more configuration, like if you have, a, for instance, is 2 is configuration, and you focused internally, uh, initially only on the label of the interface, whether it is one or two or one, two or whatsoever. And you would like to add um, something else. You would like to add a BFD check, or you would like to add the different timers, or you would like to add a password. So meaning all these things requires additional XML structure around the keys uh, and values, and you need to extend your um, uh, template. So um, the generic solution that exists around this that you could uh, split uh, their uh, way how you handle your data models. And um, you could either create, in a nutshell, using the um, um, Ginger template to create proper XML file, or you just create a JSON file with the proper uh, variables, or YAML file with the proper variables, .net, but JSON file is more important. Within the certain uh, data model, Nokia native, the open config, whatever you like. And then you could automatically convert it using some uh, Linux tool or uh, through some sort of um, calls within there. Ansible. Uh, and uh, you would get the properly working XML body for your XML message. And you could take this created body to send configuration to the network element. So you could read it quite an extensive read, it's quite a long one, around how it was automating the Nokia with some other vendors like Arista and Cisco, uh, based on the open config, uh, Yannick models and the NetConf. So how we was trying to implement this render independent model for different vendors. And there are obviously uh, various um, uh, problems when we're trying to implement open something, how it gives you exposure, how you could uh, rely on some Linux tool to create automatic um, XML stuff. So uh, all these things, uh, and, and it's just an I mean, part of the story. So uh, there are much, much more things that you would need to solve once you start really looking on the automation end to end. So there might be a need uh, for uh, creating a really complex configuration templates, which, which requires a lot of level of them, uh, nesting of if, for, else, and so on and so forth, which uh, would require very detailed analysis. Might also be the way, like you see for MD CLI, we have one playbook for uh, classical CLI, we have another playbook, how we could create the code that generically um, could be uh, running uh, to configure both the MDCLI device and non-MDCLI devices uh, in a single run, just again, depending on the parameter, what either could be extracted from the device or pre-configured if you have some sort of attribute in your data model that this device is MDCLI relevant or this device is not, because as you have seen, you could add a conditional to each and every particular task and having the uh, conditional assigned to each and every um, particular task, you might be able to uh, run uh, the task for one subset of devices based on condition or to another subset or another. Or as we said previously, with REST API where you need to collect some information and then you need to process some data and put it into CLIs or NetConf or RESTConf. So how you could into a single run, into single playbook integrate working with uh, REST API working with uh, um, SML XOF or any other things to collect this information to. It might be much more further um, use case that you might uh, want uh, to have. And um, obviously it's not possible to cover any, everything in a single this webinar. Uh, before we invite you to our network automation training that we are starting the next week on Saturday, so we have two groups where we cover all the things that we was covering today in much more details and much more. So we're speaking not only about Nokia, we're speaking also about Arista and Cisco and uh, Cumulus Link. So there's four vendors, two data center field, two service provider field, which explains you how you could uh, automate the things in vendor independent world and be working with Ansible 
We also work in with Bash, working with Python, we work with a lot of things with a window native or window independent, like open config models. So something that you have seen right now, but in much bigger scale, with much bigger level on details, with much bigger amount of the demos. So if you are interested, we still have some places. We have two groups, Saturday morning, 9 a.m. GMT, and Wednesday's evening, 19 GMT. So literally this time, like we start on day today, but on Wednesdays. Um, thank you very much for your attention. I really appreciate you take your time in your evening to come and to hear from us. Um, any questions if you have from your side, we're happy to answer. Uh, or um, you could also join our Slack um, where we doing all this stuff. So the first question, um, uh, is it possible to treat Nokia devices as Linux applications? Uh, example, Nginx, can I create a hood candidate config file delivered to router and apply the changes? Uh, uh, yes, so the, uh, the answer is yes, you cannot treat it though as a Linux device. So as we previously, uh, I think briefly shown, there is a possibility in the SRS config file uh, called the uh, uh, SRC. So SRC means that you uh, specify the whole file somewhere in your local host. Uh, you could create it also using Ansible or manually, it's up to you. Uh, and uh, this file, should be structured in the way like configuration. So starting with config global and then all the father uh, tree uh, down to all the elements you'd like to configure. Um, and uh, if it is uh, legacy, so non model driven, you just start with the config and uh, ends like exit all. And then you might also would like to add a save option here. If it is a model driven, you need to add uh, in the beginning config global. And in the end, you would need to have a commit. So basically what it will say, so it will take uh, all uh, the things that you have with file, like apply it uh, command by command on the device using the commit. So it's not like a replacement of the configs that you already have. So it's not like replacing the file. It's rather it's augmentation of the, of the file that you have in your uh, network element. Um, thank you very much. Uh, if you have further questions, you could uh, follow us uh, in the, you could uh, send it or share with us on the, our uh, web page. You could uh, join our Slack if you like, and uh, we'll be happy to see you in our um, uh, training that we are starting soon. I uh, hope you stay safe uh, during this COVID time. You and your families uh, yeah, try not to get into any <laughs> bad uh, occasions, and uh, hope to see you in our. Uh, new events. Thank you very much, guys. Take care. Goodbye.